Hey guys, so I'm going to dive into this. We had a couple really good questions from some people in our VIP group. Um, you know, if you saw the other videos of me, by the way, I did get a haircut, so I probably look totally different. Um, so those questions were around how to evaluate your project, like how to evaluate the land, um, how to increase the value of that land, and also what do investors get back after working with you from working with you. So there's two major categories here, and uh, we have two different VIP clients here, one that's looking at barren land, and then another that's looking at a land that already has a home on it, both rural land, of course. Um, and these are pretty different scenarios. So we're going to go over both, and I'm going to start with uh, the land hunting process and just kind of how I evaluate this. So what I start with is I look for three properties in my category that I would be interested in in purchasing. So I'm just going to share my screen with you and I'm going to walk through this process. So let me get this stuff out of the way here. So I chose a few properties and I'm going to go through kind of why I think I only spent like 20 minutes doing this, by the way, I've not spoken to any real estate agents. I haven't, um, uh, I haven't been and visited any of these or anything. So, uh, but nonetheless, I can filter through about 90% of them that I know are not going to be ideal for what I'm looking for. So we're starting with barren land right now. We're starting in BC. Um, you know, it's what we're most familiar with and whatnot. So yeah, so this is 126 acres. It's 450,000. Um, one thing you want to watch out with, obviously, this one has some riverfront, which is very unique and very cool. Uh, this one, yeah, 1.7 kilometers of riverfront. Uh, you know, it's less than 10 minutes from town. It has five separate creeks with the possibility for microhydro, which is really awesome. Uh, microhydro, it's like a dream for anybody living off grid. I think that's, uh, that's really cool. It also has uh, pockets of cedar and spruce. So that's high value timber that you could either use and process yourself or keep or you know, sell it or whatever. And um, uh, the, one of the reasons why I like this is you can see that there's some hillside out going like up from the river. So you, uh, personally, I don't, I don't like land that's like right on a river. Um, then you're kind of in a flood zone. If there was an extreme weather event that were to come, your entire property could be taken out. So the only reason that I'm okay with it being on a river is because there's higher elevation, the land is actually a higher elevation uh, than the river. So yeah, that is, uh, that's one option there. So that one also has waterfall on it, um, which is pretty sweet. <laughs> um, and again, for like 450,000 and it's near, you know, a pretty, pretty cool, well-known town in BC too. So that's cool. Um, this one is 930,000. It's 306 acres, so almost twice the size. Uh, what, what caught my eye with this one is that, um, again, it's, it's near a good town, but the, some of the biggest things is, again, it's on a river, and this is odd because normally I don't really go for properties on a river, but uh, it's, it's really cool. It's highly sought after, so your resale value and your attraction value to get uh, clients or, or attract investors and partners and things like that is, is a lot higher. And this one particularly is both ALR, agricultural zoning, and also no zone. So it's kind of split zoning. Uh, and no zoning is what our land is zoned as, which means that you can do pretty much whatever you want on it. You don't need a business license to operate. Uh, you can build as many things as you want. Uh, they still have to be to building code, but there's no bylaws with that like whatsoever. So yes, this is a very cool property and still has 1.4 kilometers of riverfront. I actually am kind of familiar with this. So I, I know that this is a little bit out of the flood zone and I know the river uh, a little a little well, a little more well or however we, how we're supposed to say that. Um, so uh, yeah. And uh, then lastly, I found this one. This one's going for around 700,000. It's only 46 acres. It's close to uh, a large town uh, in BC here. So this is, um, again, what caught my eye with this. This is really odd because I, I normally don't pick stuff with 
with rivers and whatnot but uh this again is on a river so it just so happens that these are the three that came up in my first uh, 20 minutes of searching that i thought were pretty cool and unique this one's like my least favorite and the reason why is because it seems like there's a lot of it that's actually on the riverfront um but again there's a hill here that it's showing in the photos that so i think i'm not sure but i think that a good portion of it is actually on this hillside so that you're up from the river so that if it were to flood then not all of your land would be flooded and and that said i would never build a house right next to the river i would build it up on the hillside so then you get a cool view and it's not going to get destroyed by the water um but then there's a portion of it here as well that you can see is right on the river in my opinion this is this is flood zoney uh i wouldn't build i wouldn't invest like crazy amounts of money in, into this bottom area obviously people do this all the time uh but we just had a huge event in bc uh last year actually that took out like hundreds of homes thousands of homes tens of thousands of homes it was huge it was huge uh flooding incident and uh yeah just a big rainstorm came through and the rivers overflowed and it took out people's property like crazy so that was a uh, a good reminder to not be building stuff in the flood zone um but another and but the reason why i mean this is kind of okay in my opinion uh or might might be worth at least looking at is because it actually has some cool like retro buildings down here um i don't know if there's any direct photos of them i don't think there is but uh yeah there's there's some cool like little retro old old kind of buildings on there that might be cool to uh, uh and easy to turn into a um airbnb stay uh, potentially so for example there's one that kind of looks like this like retro old like this old school cabin or kind of like an old school kind of like saloon type thing like type building almost which is kind of sweet so you could probably quickly renovate that and turn that into something that's going to generate some cash flow uh so yeah anyway if we're looking at the prices we're looking at some of the uniqueness factors we're looking at the lot sizes um so uh yeah so after looking at these you know you get 126 acres for 450,000 you can get 306 acres for 230,000 and you can get uh, 46 acres for 700,000. So what I'm trying to do is I'm taking the average of these or the median of these just kind of off the top of my head. I, after looking at these, I feel pretty confident that we can find land for around the $800,000 mark. Um, and like not just any land, but like a pretty cool piece of land with some pretty unique factors to it that can attract people. So um, that is a little bit on the high side of the average, but it's better. It's always better to uh, to be on that high side, um, in, in my opinion. You know, essentially, if you told a partner that you were going to you know, that you could find land for $450,000, say, which is the lowest uh, number that we've seen here, then, and then what if land prices go up or what if that property sells and then you can't find something else that's 450,000, that kind of just sets the expectations wrong from the get-go. So it's always best to uh, put kind of a, um, a buffer in there and make sure that you're setting expectations appropriately and expecting that or planning that things uh, might not work out exactly as planned so yeah keep a buffer in there next i look for three properties so these were all barren land right next i look at three properties that are fully built out like with the things all the things that uh that i would want kind of thing and you're never going to find exactly what you're going to build or what you're going to create on your property but uh you can still find something that is generally going to compare so you know for example there's 200, 233 acres for about 3 million bucks. This place has a nice house on it. Like it's quite a nice house. Um, it has a small barn, has a riding arena, it's fenced, it has a well drilled. Um, you know, an argument could be made that some of those other barren lots are, have a lot more cool factor because they do have the river frontage. Um, so for this example, Personally, I don't plan on building a crazy nice house like that. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a decent sized nice house. So I don't, 
I don't plan on, on building that, but we plan on building more things. You know, we plan on building some Airbnb stays. We plan on building uh, some orchard and farm stuff and a passive solar geothermal greenhouse. Um, you know, there's, so there's, you know, a studio for meditation and uh, yoga on our mountaintop, like all, all these other buildings can, uh, and like a large shop and things like that. So all these other buildings and wow factor can kind of um, make up for the differentiation in what is actually physically on the land if you're trying to be uh, compared directly. Uh, so property number two is uh, uh, 360 acres. This is almost 4.5 million. Now, this is a good example uh, because this place is in Chase. So it's some of these other properties that we were looking at that were barren land were actually closer to larger and more desirable towns and areas and this place it has three houses on it um it has multiple titles the multiple titles thing is actually a big value addition the three the houses are pretty crappy like they're pretty run down everything on the property is pretty run down um barns shops irrigation has lots of like massive fields it has you know a drilled well and all that stuff it's close to a major town but you know potentially not as desirable as some other areas um so uh, it and it is in a flood zone as well. So that's that's that one. And number three, uh, this place is 29 acres, going for 2.6 mil roughly. This is a small, much smaller property, but they have kind of a full equestrian center. Uh, you know, it's um, it, it's it's an older place too, but yeah, it's got the it's got the house, barns, uh, like small house, riding arena um a little clubhouse on it and things like that so you know it has everything that you need all the basic infrastructure and you know a bit of a it has the revenue potential as well from the equestrian center so basically now what we're going to do is we're going to take these and, and now we're going to get an average value of of these these are properties that are fully developed and um you know this is worth between 2.6 mil and 4.6 mil so we're going to take the average of that and uh, we're going to say that that's around, say, 3.2 million. So 3.2 million divided by 800,000 of the barren land average is four. So if you buy barren land for 800,000, you can make an argument that if you're going to develop it to this degree, um, that you can increase its value by 4x. So in this case, the specific things that are increasing the value of the added infrastructure are the homes, the structures like barns, shops, greenhouses, animal shelters, um, and anything else that you're interested in building. Like for example, we've built uh, a hydrotherapy spa, well, multiple of them. So we have some saunas and some hot tubs and you know, we, we would like to build a meditation studio and like a big greenhouse, like all that stuff adds into that. Uh, fencing is a big one. People like fencing. Drilled well and irrigation are, are big ones too. So, um, yeah. And ultimately, when you're talking to somebody about this, it's pretty easy to get excited about it, right? Because you're looking at some of these other pro properties and they're worth like, you know, let's say around 3 million. Like, look at that one, worth 3 million, but it's kind of run down and it, you know, it's not really that cool, doesn't have a lot of wow factor. Versus here, we can go buy these riverfront properties with a waterfall on them for only 800K. So imagine if you put all of those structures on this waterfall property uh, with, with river frontage, that would just be incredible. That would be amazing. And the value, it, it, it makes sense that the value is there. Um, so that is, that's kind of the in how you would project the value if you're looking for barren land. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll dig a little deeper into this. So now I want to compare an example to a lot that already has a home on it. This is quite a bit different. So Krista in our VIP group is looking at a lot. Um, and we'll pull it up here. So yeah, this is in Salmon Arm. This is, I believe it's uh, 160 acres, 163 acres, 1.6 million. It has a beautiful home on it already, which is awesome. Uh, you know, it has some outdoor areas. I'll just get there. Yeah, it has some beautiful outdoor areas. You know, it has a little uh, a little shed and shop. It it's fenced. It has 
a well drilled. It has all that good stuff. Um, it actually also has potential to be subdivided, which is uh, really awesome. There's tons of things that we can do with that. So um, obviously starting out with a place that's 800,000 in barren land, uh, there's a lot more work to do, but it's way cheaper versus something that already has a house on it, but it's double the price. Uh, so it's it's kind of it's kind of different in how you can increase the value on that because one of the main value additions, like we just went over with Barren Land, is all the structures that you're going to put in place. But on Krista's Law, most of those are already in place. So now, what can you do to increase the land value? Um, so, in my mind, like I still think. You know, some of these other places were, you know, we said the average of the of the fully developed lots was about around 3.2 million. I still think that that is fully doable uh, with this lot. So you could still potentially uh, double the lot value. I think personally, you could go to the extreme and you could actually triple the lot value still. So that would be, you know, you get a little bit more targeted about the things that you might build. So a shop, for example, on this lot, the current shop is quite small. Um, you know, you could build something larger, you could put one to two rental suites above it. That's a huge thing. It helps people. Um, that's a huge thing for evaluation because it helps people with the financial income for the rental income to actually get the mortgage to buy the house in the first place. So appraisers and the bank and whatnot will, will evaluate that much higher with some rental suites. Um, subdividing, you know, that said that was a huge opportunity in this particular lot. Well, that's massive. Uh, you could go and subdivide that. Even if you don't subdivide it and you just get the approval to subdivide it and then build another home, um, like the approval to do those things, just that approval is worth a ton of money. Uh, or you could actually pay the fee and subdivide it, but then just keep the land and still own it and have the ability to build more structures in the future. Um, so although that would be a massive, like drastic value increase there. Uh, you know, you could do, I, I know a little bit about uh, Krista's background, she has a background in business and marketing, you know, her sister uh, is coming in on the project and she is doing some, some more of the farming and homesteading type stuff. You know, Chris has expressed some, um, you know, expressed that she may want to host some retreats and, uh, and, and events and things like that. And, and that would be, that would be super cool. So, you know, what you could do with that in mind is maybe you make a common area for a retreat center. Um, you know, maybe that has a common kitchen in it or a yoga studio for meditation or maybe some extra housing for guests. Uh, you know, maybe you do the Airbnb thing and you build some uh, little A-frame micro cabins outside and you rent those out, uh, you know, and then on the animals and homesteading side of things, maybe you build a hay barn or a firewood shelter, uh, some animal paddocks, stables, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things increase the land value by quite a bit. You know, you could throw a spa in, like we talked about, a sauna, some outdoor showers, a natural swimming hole, I think would be really cool on this property. The well is not super strong on this property. Um, the gallons per minute on it are, are quite low. So uh, um, a pond would actually help refurbish and replenish that aquifer, which is very, very good, and also double as a um, natural swimming hole is kind of like a unique wow factor piece for the land value. Uh, so personally, I think that those things could, you know, this property could safely be worth 2.5 times its current value. Um, so you could probably justify, you know, in my opinion, uh, with, you know, if you're trying to do all that stuff, like a $3.2 million projected evaluation, uh, I think you could justify more personally, I'd probably go for like 3.6, maybe 3.8 something like that. Um, but then again, if you wanted to get higher, you could do something drastic. You could, you could turn this place into like a crazy permaculture, regenerative agriculture, earthworks phenomenon, build, you know, a bunch of ponds and have natural waterfalls and all sorts of stuff. There's so many, so many opportunities with rural land that you just don't get in, in traditional housing locations. So yeah, I mean, the sky is really the limit. You could, you could make this space so incredibly unique that you couldn't even put a price on it um so yeah um and now i'm going to kind of explain and show how we actually put this so that was all pretty vague right like if you said that to an investor they'd probably be like okay like where's the proof right like how are you going to get there 
And that's where uh, a, a, a good business plan comes in place so that they establish just some trust factor uh, for them. And also cash flow projections. Personally, I love looking at numbers anytime that I've invested in anything or been pitched. My first question is, okay, where's the numbers? How have you laid this all out? So I'm going to open that up for you. So this is our off-grid property financials. This is our cash flow projections and where everything I just said kind of comes into play and how you can prove that to an investor is by putting together cash flow projections like this. So I'll just briefly kind of explain uh, what that is. And um, so here we're looking at a financial forecast. So we started our project in 2021. Uh, so that's why this is starting in March of 2021. And um, we, essentially what this is, is this is showing, you know, our total revenue right here. And then it's showing our expenses. So the salaries for people to pay people to pay contractors, etc. Um, and the operating expenses. So this is, this is anything like building materials or cell phone costs or, you know, getting a well drilled or legal fees or internet or food or animals, equipment financing, all of that good stuff. And then uh, you tally that all up. So by the way, we this is available. I'm actually turning this into a template for everybody to use so that you can make this uh, way, way faster for yourself. We've I've just done this in previous businesses, but uh, so I, I, I was able to do it relatively quickly. But um, ultimately, sometimes this costs like $2,000 to get a financial advisor or something to put together for you. And uh, yeah, then you come down. Um, and then we get into the land investment stuff here. And this is where you can kind of prove it. So that's, uh, that's these lines here on my screen. So our initial starting land value was 235,000. That was roughly what we evaluated our land at. Uh, we picked, we didn't have much money. So we picked like really cheap land that no one really wanted and have still managed to do really awesome things with it. So. Uh, then what we did is we attached a multiple to the amount of money that's invested into the land. So, um, for example, uh, if you are hiring someone to do this, your multiple is going to be lower because some of that money uh, is going to be going towards your uh, towards the labor and not just materials. So we did we've done everything on our property ourselves. So all of the investment money was going directly towards materials and nothing was wasted on labor. So our investment multiple uh, for this, our land value investment multiple is a little bit higher. I would say, uh, you know, ours is around, we put ours around 3.5, which has been fairly accurate now that we're, you know, a year and a half out, we can look back at the work and, and what the land, how the land value has actually increased. So yeah, I would say that that is, um, is pretty accurate. You know, we could maybe lower it to around three, and I would say if you're hiring someone, then you'd be more around like the two mark, whatever, you know, your, your, uh, whatever work you're hiring out. So how that works essentially is that if you invest $10,000 into the property, then the property value will increase by $20,000. If you're hiring somebody, for example, um, for us, if we put $10,000 into our property, we do all the labor on top of that then our, that $10,000 invested will actually account for a $35,000 increase in the land value. And then, uh, and then so all of those, basically all these expenses, these are things going into the land value. So, you know, here's $80,000 that we invested in building materials in the first month, right? And then a few months later, we invested another 36 and then another 37, another 37 and so on. So all those things are adding up. That's that. Those are things that are directly increasing land value. All those things we're putting a three point five multiple on that. Uh, and then you know, for example, here we put forty thousand dollars in, um, and then we put a three point five multiple on it. Um, so that's forty thousand dollar land investment with the three point five multiple is around one hundred forty thousand. So that increased the land value by one hundred forty thousand. And you can see along the bottom here how this keeps going up and up and up uh, over time. So that's how you can demonstrate to an investor how you're actually going to do this and how that, like this is your proof essentially to, to be able to show them ex your exact plan, which is, which is very needed when we're talking about 
all this stuff. And I know that might be a little um, confusing. So we'll, we're going to go back to that. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of the first half of the equation. Now, the other half, when you're going to approach an investor and whatnot, is going to be evaluating the economic engine side, which is the business side. So this is whatever you plan to create on the land. Maybe it's Airbnb and hip camp rentals. Maybe it's you're going to host events and retreats. Maybe uh, you're going to grow food and sell it or raise cattle. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you create an online course like this, so you don't even need people to come to your land. I, whatever it is that you want to do that's going to generate some cash and that's worth something. So now we're going to evaluate that as well. So evaluate that as well. So the easiest thing uh, for an, from an evaluation perspective that I'll use as an example is using Airbnb. So let's say that... Um, Let's say we plan to have five wall tents. This is actually real numbers from our property. So we have five wall tents. They rent out for around 300 a night and we have about a 60% monthly booking capacity. That's being conservative. And um, so with that, that's roughly 18 days out of the month that they're rented. So that's, that's, uh, oh, that's wrong. So 18 uh, times 300 a night. I'm just gonna check this and make sure that it is accurate. Yeah, so 18, 18 nights times 300 a night is 5,400 a month. Uh, that's per one wall tent, and we have five, so multiply that by five. That's 27,000 a month, and we're open for about seven months out of the year. That's 100, let's just call it 190,000 a year. Um, so, yeah, that's maybe we want to increase the value of the business to try to demonstrate more value to an investor and. So let's say we add some camping on hip camp and uh, that let's say that that adds another $5,000 a month times six months is 30,000. So now we're up to 219,000 a year. You know, I know Krista, for example, might want to host some events. She's talked about some really cool masterminds. So maybe she starts doing that on her property and that brings in another 40,000 a year. Um, and uh, yeah, so now let's say that she's up to, let's call it 300,000 a year. So one method of evaluating a business is to put a multiple on it. So common multiples are between two and four. So we're just going to use a multiple of three. And uh, that would mean that the business's value is 900,000. There are other methods of doing this. I've written them in the course in much more detail. So they're in writing in the course if you want to go through that and look at other methods of evaluating. Now, the land, Krista's land, or the projection of her land value could be around, you could probably argue for 3.6 million, and your business is around 900,000, which totals 4.5 million. Now, to make an investor feel secure, we want to be able to tell them that they will be able to get their money out if plans don't work. So, Let's say you want to keep majority ownership of the land and the evaluation comes out to around 4.5 million. You could ask for 1.3 million for 30% ownership. So you give them 30% ownership and they give you 1.3 million. Um, or if you want to make them feel like they're getting a better deal uh, to make them feel safe with the investment, you could say that, uh, you know, hey, I actually think the evaluation is 4.5 million but we'll be extra conservative and say it's just 3 million. That's below the target land value and doesn't even include the business. So basically the investors is getting the upside from the business for free. That's, you know, that's a bonus that you're, you're offering them to have. Um, so we'd like to give you 30% ownership on the land and 30% ownership in the business uh, for a $900,000 investment. So that's 30%, like roughly, well, that's, yeah, 30% of 3 million. So, um, and the money will only be spent on things that increase the land value. That way, if it doesn't work, at least we've increased the land value and you, the investor, can get your money back. And you can sign a deal with them uh, to say that so that they get their money back before you, before the banks, before anybody else. So now you take that 900,000, and you put the majority of it against the mortgage uh, and then save some to help pay for the mortgage for the first six months, maybe 12 months. Um, so while you're getting the business running, you can make sure and feel safe that your mortgage is covered. 
uh, and then use the rest to build the structures that you will need to operate the business. So the added infrastructure from building that to operate the business will increase the value of the land. And then you can use it to start generating cash flow on the land. Now you can use the cash flow to continue building out the land, um, use, uh, so a couple of key points here, maybe you don't wanna give away that much ownership or maybe you wanna buy back ownership in the future. I always recommend having that as a clause in your shareholders agreement. So when you take on an investor, you're going to create a corporation and that corporation will have a shareholders agreement attached to it. Now, if you don't know much about that stuff, it's all in the course. So you can read, read it there. And so if you haven't read that yet, then uh, maybe go there for some context. But essentially, you can write in that shareholders agreement uh, that you reserve buyback rights. And this means that you can buy out your investor at fair market value in the future. And uh, using this tool, you can actually begin to think of an investor as more of a long-term loan with interest. Uh, and it just makes the investor feel secure, essentially. So um, they feel secure because they technically own a portion of that land. But you know that you have the right to buy them out in the future. So therefore, you can kind of think of it more as a long-term loan. Um, so essentially, it's sort of similar to a loan since you can buy the investor out. Uh, and then the interest is basically the increased value of the investor's shares. So as the land and business value go up, so, were, so will their share value. So you'll end up paying more than they invested to buy them out, which is fair because they gave the cash to start and the land would essentially be the collateral. So that's just another way of framing it um, to, to see how this can be used as a financial tool. So you know, in this particular example, you could potentially subdivide and sell the other lot and use that to buy the investors out completely. And now you've essentially gone from no land and no money to 100% ownership of your own land. You know, it might not be as much land as you originally bought, but that's still pretty awesome. So, or you could take on another investor. Uh, so for example, if you wanted your project to speed up and you needed more money or whatever the reasons might be. Now, if you gave away 30% ownership to start, that means you still have 19% ownerships to barter with if you wanted to keep majority ownership and get more cash. So if you waited a year and you put a bunch of work in in that year and you increase the land value and the business value and you demonstrated a working model for the economic engines on the land, the land and business will naturally be worth a lot more and then it gets even easier to attract investors because you have something already. You own the land, you have the economic engines uh, running. Um, so the first investor got 30% ownership in exchange for 900,000. So that's 300,000 for every 10% ownership. But maybe a year later, after you've done all that work, the land value has gone up by 50%. So now you can actually sell 10% ownership for 450,000 instead of just 300,000. So, you know, it's a weird area to get into all of this because there's an infinite amount of options. So it's almost paralyzing and can also cause a lot of uncertainty because there's no clear path that is abundantly apparent. There's just so many options. But in the course, I laid out common options on how, these structure, on how to structure your deal with an investor and the goals that you're working toward when you're putting together an offer and a deal structure. Uh, so these goals can give you some direction so that you're not uh, feeling like, you know, overwhelmed by all of the options. So for example, a major goal is to reduce your investor's risk and also reduce your risk at the same time. So reducing your investor's risk helps make them feel safe in investing with you. Um, so for example, Maybe your partner doesn't want to invest 900000 Maybe they don't have that much money right now, um, or maybe they're just plain old not feeling comfortable enough with that. So you could structure the deal in three phases so that they feel more comfortable and it reduces the risk of them losing all their money, essentially. So phase one could be like this. Phase one could be they send 480000 This gives you a 30% deposit on buying the land, and then you go buy it. And then after the deal goes through and you own the land, sometimes that can take a while. I don't know. Maybe these people don't want to 
move out for six months. So, you know, six months later, you take possession. That gives your investors some time to make some more money and get to know you guys better and just feel confident about all of it. Um, and then phase two, they send 250000 And that you can use to cover the mortgage payments for a year and set up some basic Airbnb stays to prove that the model actually works. You're proving to the investor that the model works. And then phase three, after you've proven all that, that it works, then they send the remaining 170,000 and you use that to expand your operations. And all of this can be pre-written into an agreement so that they legally have to send those money, that money when you hit that benchmark. Uh, so that's, that's a way to make it seem less scary for an investor um, and more manageable for an investor than sending all of the money up front. Now, this is just one example. Uh, in the course, I give more and in more detail. I'll do another video on actually structuring agreements specifically because there's lots of options there too. So now let's jump back for a minute. Let's apply these examples to the barren land example. So barren land is a little bit different. Uh, what I would try to do to find an investor for around $800,000 um, is I'd break it down like this. So they invest $420,000 for phase one. You use that to put 50% down and buy the land because it's barren. You'll have to put a minimum of like 35 to 50%. So let's just say it's 50%. So you use that to put down 50% and buy the land. And the extra $20,000 is for legal fees. So phase two, after the land is acquired, then they send the remaining $380,000. And this is to be uh, invested directly into the land. You can even offer to sign that contractually so that you can only spend it on things that are directly uh, to do with the land. So you could pre-lay that out and then give them that plan to make them feel confident. Um, so here's how I, just like off the top of my head, here's how I think that it would be best used. So 40K to drill a well, have a pump and pressure tank installed in a pump house. 40,000 to buy a good size solar kit um, and get internet hooked up. 50K to buy a couple shipping containers, put a roof over them and turn them into a heated common area kitchen so that you and your guests can use it. And so that your batteries can stay warm in the winter for your solar, that is a big thing you wanna think about. 30K for a couple saunas and or hot tubs to attract guests and create some outdoor showers. 100K to buy or build five A-frame micro cabins, decorate them nicely, put some cheap solar power string lights outside and take good photos of them. You know, then you're already up and running and you can get some cash flow coming in. 10K to put a down payment on a tiny home and finance it so that you have a nice place to live. Uh, the tiny home can belong to the company and then therefore the revenue from the company pays for its financing and you can, uh, you can keep that and live in it. And then in the future, you could, for example, maybe build a house of your own or buy something else of your own or, or whatever, and then use that tiny home as another rental option or for a caretaker or employee or something like that. Um, and then 10K to clear some spots and gravel them for some more long-term residents. Now you still have 100K left over as a buffer in case something goes wrong. And if you don't use it up by like nickel and diming it to get things going or if, you know, if nothing major comes up, which is hopeful, that's the plan, then you can reinvest that to get more cash generating options or machinery, or maybe you need a good truck. Maybe you want a wood mill so that you can process your own timber and build things or whatever else, you know, 100,000 can go a long way if you uh, use it properly. But that's, you know, that's the if, if you use it properly, because we've thrown $100,000 out the window very quickly by buying the wrong things. And that is a part of why uh, that we're happy that you guys are in this course, so we can help you avoid those mistakes. So this is still probably isn't your ideal dream. Uh, but for example, the client of ours that's looking at barren land is looking to create a community. So we're still a ways out from that, but now you have land, you have basic necessities and infrastructure, you have cash flow, and you're well on your way towards your dream. Um, you can start having long-term residents come in and they could sign a lease to pay a monthly strata fee to cover maintenance costs and dedicate four hours a day to helping you build things on the land. So that's pretty well on your way to starting the community. Uh, you know, and if you don't want to use air, now, 
If you don't want to use Airbnb, that's a big thing that comes up. Um, that's fine. It doesn't mean that you have to use it forever. Maybe you have a better idea that you want to start with instead of Airbnbs. But you know what I like about them too is that if and when you stop using them eventually, then uh, then you have some awesome little micro cabins that volunteers can stay at, which is pretty sweet. So it's never a bad idea to have those extra livable structures on your property. Um, and now that lot that you paid 800K for a year later is now worth, you know, let's say around 1.2 million. So if you went, and so if you wanted to move the project along faster, you could go back and take on another investment par partner and give away less ownership for more money, like we talked about before, and still maintain majority ownership. Um, yeah. So another option now is that you prove the business model for Airbnb or whatever other business you want to create on the land. You could create a separate corporation and you basically, you run all the businesses through that corporation. So now you could actually take an investor on to expand the business operations and that way they don't even need to own any part of your actual land. So that's, that's another uh, kind of corporate strategy option. So that is also in the course. If you haven't gone through it, you can check that out. So another big question that we're getting is, so after you do all this, what do these investors get in return? <laughs> and that's a good, that's a really good question. Um, because a lot of the time, like, what if someone invests with you and they own 30% of your land, but you never sell it? Then what? Then they've just like given you this money. You know, sometimes that doesn't really fully make sense. So I just want to uh, go over so a couple things here. And the first thing is that ultimately, like we've only really touched on conversations of like what our, uh, our investor will get back. And um, most of the time, everybody that we've talked with is just not really worried about it. Uh, it. It might be that, you know, in the future, the idea is that the economic engines are doing well enough that they could get some cash out of that each year as a dividend. And, you know, they'd be pretty happy with that. But ultimately, most of everyone we've talked to, they don't want to take their value out. Uh, to them, they want to have a place that they can come that is fully self-sufficient in this crazy world, somewhere that's, you know, good for them and their family to use as a vacation home. You know, it's like a little cabin property that they can go up to. Like, to them, that's cool. And, and investing that amount of money, they're just happy to have that um, and be taking part in a really cool project. So that is honestly, that has been enough for a lot of people to get involved, um, but you still want to be able to demonstrate more tangible value to them as well. Uh, so, so I just want to reframe this for a second and, and share what a lot of real estate investors are doing right now. And, and this, is, this is the alternative option to investing with you. So one is that if they just have their money sitting in their bank account, inflation is eventually going to make that money worth next to nothing. So they need to do something with it. They need to do something that is going to protect them against inflation and increase the value of their money. Um, uh, so two, there are tons of real estate investors that are buying $2 million properties just to rent them out for $3,000 a month. So as long as the property is paying its own property taxes and the maintenance, they're relatively happy. Maybe they even make a small amount of profit off them. Um, but they're happy because the value of the real estate is expected to go up. So their value continues to rise with inflation and hopefully at a bit of a faster rate. And because they can take loans against that land and buy more, so they're building a portfolio. So let's put that into perspective. They could invest $2 million and they get $36,000 a year. And the uh, increase of the land value in five years, you could say, might go up by about 75%. Or they could invest 800,000 and they could get 30% ownership of an asset that generates $200,000 per year. And the uh, five-year projection plan for the land development and increase in value is to go up by 350%. So since they only own 30%, a good way to compare that is to say that they just invested $800,000 to achieve $60,000 a year and increase their asset value by 350%. So uh, let's put that side by side. We'll break that down into even ratios. 
So a regular real estate investment looks like they invest 800,000, they achieve 14,000 a year in income and a 75% increase in, in their asset value. Or if they invest with you or us, they would invest $800,000, they'd achieve $60,000 a year, which is four times the amount that they would on a regular real estate investment and 350, or 350% increase in the asset value. And that is 4.5 times uh, as much of, of an increase as they would also get on a regular real estate investment. So it just makes sense. Uh, essentially, it's a better investment than other real estate investments. Uh, plus they get a bunch of bonuses. So uh, the investment amount is much lower, which is cool because that means that there's actually a broader market out there available to invest with you uh, because it's a, it's a lower barrier to entry than traditional real estate investments. Uh, the return is four times as high, like we mentioned. They get cool bonuses out of it. You know, they, they get a cool vacation property that they can come to. They get a backup plan that's fully self-sufficient uh, to feel safe with their and their family uh, with this crazy world right now. They could actually get cash flow out of this. It's kind of hard to get uh, like high levels of cash flow out of a uh, traditional real estate investment for like residential property, for example. Um, so yeah, like for example, maybe you have an agreement where the money from the economic engines is reinvested into the land for the first three to five years. And then after that, you actually pay out dividends. So your investment partner gets 30% of the cash flow, which if you automate it, it shouldn't be an issue. So, you know, if you were making uh, let's say, yeah, like 350000 a year uh, off of some of the farming and some of the Airbnb stuff and whatever economic engines you choose to do, then that person would have invested eight hundred grand, and now they're getting you know $100,000 a year back in, in basically dividends or a salary or however you might want to pay them uh, five years in the future. So that that's pretty sweet. That's a, that's like a, I don't know what, what is that? That's like a 12.5% return on their investment, not to mention the land value. That's really solid. They, you know, a lot of people would be very happy with that. Um, there are way more opportunities with rural land to create more value and more economic opportunities than there is when investing in traditional residential homes. Um, and they're just generally doing something that's good for people, good for the environment and just good for the world. So that, you know, that's just a bit of a cherry on top. Um, yeah, so other ways that you could do it if you wanted to try to give, those are those cover a lot of the things that you can do to give them their value back and, and agree on some of that stuff. Um, so here's some general options that you like other ways of structuring it. So generally their value of investment goes up. So that's a simple one. But, uh, you know, again, coming back to like, if they want that value out, how do they get that out? How do they use that value if it's stuck inside of real estate and you don't plan on selling the real estate? Um, well, here's a bunch of options. So here's another a number of things that you could propose. So you buy them out at a later date and their shares will be worth more so they make more money. So, uh, you know, you could do this by using the cash flow from the economic engines to slowly buy them out. Uh, you could remortgage after the, you increase the value of the land, and then you could use that money to buy out the investor. You could subdivide and sell a part of the lot and use that money to buy out the investor. You could get a quote for logging the land and see how much money that might bring in or restore the land and see how much you can get for carbon credits. So for example, our permaculture expert figures that in about five years time, uh, we will have about half a million dollars worth of carbon credits for our property. So we could sell those, uh, which means essentially you have to stop cutting down any trees and whatnot and just, you know, preserve and preserve and restore the land. But half a million dollars is enough to pay out our investment. So, you know, that's another unique option. Uh, you could also sell the land entirely. Like you could use this to get your foot in the door with real estate. You could do amazing things in the meantime. You could learn a lot. And then you could sell the entire property uh, and then you would pay back the investor. You take the rest of the money. And then now you can, you have the money to just go buy your own land wherever you want and do whatever you want with it. So, you know, you could buy another property on your own. That's potentially better and potentially easier, but maybe it's in a more desirable location for you. Who knows? So 
that's the that's a good example of like viewing this less as like going straight for the dream and more of like it's a it's you're climbing stairs to get there it's just one step at a time and building that value building that knowledge building that credibility is all huge so yeah i mean another option without buying them out is you could agree with them that you could remortgage the land and uh and borrow against the property and just continue building a real estate portfolio by buying more land with that money or you know maybe you increase the value by like a million bucks and you decide to uh remortgage and take out i don't know 500,000 600,000 and they take 200 and you take four what i got you there's so many options with that um yeah so that's uh they can take cash flow from the economic engines you know they take part in the enterprise value of the business the business itself is also worth something not just the land which means uh you know you can also like leverage the business meaning you could sell it meaning you could borrow money against it things like that um and then of course you know the bonuses that we've talked about so yeah that is today's video i hope that that answered some questions for you and gave you some more direct uh, knowledge. I hope that was clear enough as I, as I went through some of that stuff and we'll continue to talk about these things. So please throw in the comments, anything that wasn't clear, anything that you want to learn more about. Um, I think the cash flow projections and that kind of stuff uh, will potentially be a big help for people to kind of demonstrate that and see that um, it's basically the structure that all this information can be presented as. So, that would be a you know a pitch deck, a business plan, and your financial projection sheet. Um, and yeah, if you're in the VIP group, we got a call coming up, so we'll send the submission form and please post all your questions in there too. Uh, I think this next call is going to be really awesome and really exciting to uh, really excited to chat with you guys. Sweet, thank you everybody. Have a great day.